Chapter 47. The Parade. Does it hurt? Brightbill touched the smooth surface where his mother's foot used to be. No, it does not hurt, said Roz, but it will be difficult for me to walk. The bears huddled behind the gosling and stared at the robot's stump of a leg. Nobody understood how a foot could pop off like that, or how that Roz could remain calm. Roz, I'm sorry my cubs attacked you, said Mother Bear. Sometimes they're completely out of control. It is okay. I know how they are at this age. I can't thank you enough for saving Thorn. I promise my cubs will never bother you again. Isn't that right? Yes, Mother, said Nettle and Thorn together. The robot tried to walk. She bobbled up and down on her uneven legs, which worked well enough on the flat surface of the cliff top. But once she entered the forest, her problem became clear. The smooth stump had no grip, and it slipped around on the forest floor. So Roz tried hopping on her one good foot. She took a few crunching hops and then clanged into a tree trunk. A few more hops, and she crashed into the undergrowth. I'm really sorry I broke off your foot, said Thorn as he helped the robot up from the weeds. I forgive you, said Roz. Whether she was capable of true forgiveness is anybody's guess. But they were nice words, and Thorn felt better when he heard, th he heard them. It looks like I will have to crawl home, said Roz. Nonsense, said Mother. I have a better idea. Mother Bear lay flat on the ground while her cubs boosted Roz onto her back. Then Brightbill fluttered onto the bear's broad shoulders, and when they were both safely aboard, the group set off th through the forest. The robot was heavy, but she was no trouble for the giant animal. Mother Bear strolled along as if it were perfectly normal for a robot to be riding on her back. They made quite a grand procession, all walking together like that, and the procession became even grander as deer and raccoons and birds and all kinds of other animals joined in. Everyone wanted to see the mother robot riding the mother bear. The group wound its way past ancient trees and over rolling meadows and through babbling streams, collecting more and more curious animals as they went. It was the grandest parade of wildlife anyone had ever seen, and leading the way was our robot, Roz. But the parade couldn't last forever. As the sun went down, the other animals began drifting away, one by one, and when the parade finally arrived at the nest, only the original members remained. Here we are, said Mother Bear, helping Roz down into the garden. Now wasn't that better than crawling all the way home? Oh yes, that was wonderful, said the robot. I cannot imagine a better ending to this day. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was amazing, squeaked the gosling. My friends won't believe me when I tell them I rode across the island on the back of a bear. I'm glad you enjoyed yourselves, Mother Bear smiled. It's the least I could do after all the trouble these two caused. Her smile became a frown, and she glared at her cubs, who suddenly took great interest in a pebble on the ground. It was late, and it had been a long, difficult day for everyone, so the bears said goodbye and headed back to their cave. Brightbill and Roz stood in the garden and watched their new friends lumber away. Then the gosling said, Mama, do you think you'll ever walk again? I am not sure, said the robot, but I know who to ask for help. Now go get ready for bed. Ooh. Chapter 48 The New Foot Mr. Beaver Squinted at Roz's stump. I've never built a foot before. He stroked his whispers and muttered to himself, There are really three problems to solve. The foot needs to grip the ground, and it needs to be durable. And then there's the issue of fixing it to the leg. I might have to consult a few friends. Will she ever walk again, said Brightbill. What's that? Mr. Beaver was lost in thought. Oh, not to worry. You just sit back and leave everything to me. I love a challenge. Mr. Beaver plunked into the pond and returned a while later, rolling a large section of a tree trunk. Say hello to your new foot, he said, slapping the wood with his tail. Hello, new foot, said the robot. That's the spirit. This beauty is from one of the hardest trees I ever chewed. I just need to make a few modifications. Mr. Beaver placed the piece of wood next to Roz. He squinted, repositioned the piece, and squinted some more. With his claws, he marked different spots on the wood, and then he put his big chompers to work. 
the beaver chewed and gnawed and carved up that piece of wood, turning it over and over in its paws. Chit Chat looked down from a branch and chattered through the quiet moments. This reminds me of the time I saw a fox catch a lizard by the tail, and somehow the lizard's tail fell off and he got away, and later I saw that the lizard got a new tail, and now Roz is going to get a new foot, and everything will be fine. The wooden foot took shape, and before long, Mr. Beaver was standing beside a beautiful carving that resembled a boot. He tried to slide it over Roz's stump, but the opening was too small, so he scraped out more wood until it was a perfect fit. Very good, he said, spitting out a wood chip. My friends should be arriving any minute with the next few things we'll need. And there they are now. I'd like you all to meet Bumpkin, Lumpkin, and Rumpkin. But I call them the Fuzzy Bandits. Three fat raccoons shuffled into the garden, dragging a tangle of vines behind them. Good day, said Bumpkin. Good day, said Lumpkin. Good day, said Rumpkin. You might already know this, reader, but re raccoons have very nimble hands and the fuzzy bandits used theirs to skillfully tie those vines around the robot's leg and around her new foot. The vines caught nicely on all the dings and dents and scrapes. Once they were tied good and tight, Mr. Beaver threw back his head and hollered, Trunk trap! We could use your assistance! There was silence, and then three quick taps echoed down from the forest canopy. Ah, that'll be him, said Mr. Beaver, smiling. A very handsome woodpecker swooped into the garden. You called? came the woodpecker's musical voice. Indeed, I did. Everyone, this is my woodpecking pal, Trunk Trap. Now, Trunky, we need some tree resin. The really sticky stuff. Can you help us out? Of course I can, said the woodpecker. You've got a perfect pine right here. Trunk Trap hopped over to a crusty old pine tree and pecked a few deep holes in the bark. Thick, syrupy resin began oozing down the trunk. Mr. Beaver scooped up handfuls of the resin and smeared it all over the wooden foot and the vines until everything glistened with stickiness. And when the resin dried a short time later, Roz's foot was finished. This is wonderful, said the robot as she strolled around her garden. I am good as new. Mr. Beaver and Trunk Trap and the Fuzzy Bandits went away feeling pretty happy with themselves. They'd done a very nice thing, but it was the first wooden foot any of them had ever made, and within a week the vines were coming undone and the foot was sliding loose. So they returned, determined to get it right. They found even harder wood and even tougher vines. They experimented with resin, heating it by the fire, letting it boil and thicken until it became an indestructible glue. They kept tinkering with their design until, finally, Roz had herself a wooden foot that she could rely on. Huzzah! Mr. Beaver wrapped his knuckles on the new and improved creation. I knew we'd get it right. Roz moved slower than before, and she had a slight limp, but she was back to her old self again, and that was a relief to everyone, especially Bright Bill. Chapter 49 The Flyer With coaching from his mother, Bright Bill was becoming a truly exceptional flyer. He wasn't the biggest or the strongest, but he was the smartest. You see, he and his mother had started studying the flying techniques of other birds. They'd sit for hours and watch how hawks and owls and sparrows and vultures moved through the air. Then they'd go up to the grassy ridge and Brightbo would practice what he had learned. Soon he was diving and swooping and darting and soaring around the island. The adult geese frowned at his flying tricks but the goslings thought he was amazing. Each morning, a gaggle of them would wait on the water for Brightbill to lead them into the sky, and then, a few hours later, he'd return home to Roz, shaking his tail feathers and honking about his latest airborne adventures. Mama! The other goslings didn't know that warm air rises, so I found an updraft, and we spent the afternoon circling around and around and hardly flapped our wings at all. Mama, did you see that lightning storm today? We knew there was trouble when the wind started blowing from the north, so we flew down to some shrubs and waited for the storm to pass. Mama, we just tried to fly in formation. We all took turns at the point, but everyone liked following me the best, so I led most of the time. Chapter 50, The Button 
Brightbill was thinking about the small button on the back of his mother's head. His mother was thinking about it, too. They couldn't stop wondering what would happen if the button was pressed. And one day they decided it was time to find out. Ra sat on the floor of the nest. Her son nervously stood on a stone beside, behind her. I am ready when you are, said the robot. Okay, said the gosling. Here we go. Brightbill took a deep breath. Click. Roz's body relaxed. Her quiet roaring slowly stopped. Her eyes faded to black. Mama, can you hear me? There was no answer. Brightbill waddled around and looked at his mother's face. Her strange spark of life had gone out. The gosling had never felt more alone. He was ready to switch her back on. But what if she didn't wake up? What if she woke up different? The gosling was afraid to press the button, and he was afraid not to press the button. Brightbell took a deep breath. <sighs> Click. Roz's body tensed. Her quiet whirring slowly started. Her eyes began to glow. Mama, can you hear me? Hello, I am Roz Immunit 7134, but you may call me Roz. The robot spoke these words automatically in a language Brightbell didn't understand. His little heart raced as his worst fears seemed to be coming true. But a moment later, her familiar voice returned, and the robot said in the language of the animals, Hello, son. How long was I out? It seemed like only an instant to me. You were out for a few minutes, said the gosling as he hugged his mother, but it seemed like forever to me. Chapter 51. The Autumn. The days were getting shorter. The air was getting crisper. And one morning, Roz walked out to find a layer of frost in the garden. Autumn had come to the island. The tree leaves, which had been green for the robot's entire life, turned yellow and orange and red. Then they let go of their branches and floated down to the ground, and the forest gradually filled with the sounds of creatures scurrying through dead leaves. Tree nuts were also falling, thunking onto rocks, roots and rocks, and occasionally clanging off the robot. The smell of flowers faded as the blossoms withered. All the rich scents and colors of the island were draining away. The animals were also changing. Furry animals were growing more fur. Feathery animals were growing more feathers. Scaly animals were starting to look for new homes. Yerp, it's cooling off, croaked one frog to another. Before long, it'll be time for sleeping. Yerp, I'd better start looking for a good hole, croaked the second frog. Have you found one yet? Nah, croaked the first frog. I'll look for a hole next week. For now, I'm going to enjoy the warm sunlight while it lasts. Yerp. Many of the island animals were already thinking about their winter hibernation. Frogs, bees, snakes, and even bears would soon disappear and spend the next few months resting out of sight. And then there were the birds. Some birds, like owls and woodpeckers, would spend the winter nesting and eating the island's few remaining edibles. But the migratory birds were preparing for the long journey south to their warm wintering grounds. And among the birds destined to leave were the geese. Chapter 52. The Flock Brightbill slowly waddled into the nest. He had a confused look on his face. Mama, the other goslings said we have to leave the island soon, and we won't return for months and months. Is that true? That is true, said Roz. You know that geese migrate south for the winter. Will you migrate with us? said Brightbill. I cannot fly or swim, so I will spend the winter here on the island. Can I stay with you? I do not think that is a good idea. I think you should migrate with a flock. How long will the migration take? said Brightbill. Where will we fly? When will we come home? I do not know, said Roz. Let us go ask the others. And so the robot and the goslings walked around the pond to where Loudwing and her friends were chatting. Hello, everyone, said Roz. Brightbill has some questions about the flock's upcoming winter migration. And we'd be happy to answer them, said Loudwing. What would you like to know, little one? How long will the migration take, said Brightbill. Where will we fly? When will we come home? It'll take us a, a couple of weeks to fly south, said Loudwing. 
depending on the weather. We'll join other flocks at a beautiful lake in the middle of a great sprawling field, said another goose, and we'll come back to the island after four or five months, said someone else, depending on the weather. As they walked back to the nest, Brightbill said to his mother, Lately, I've been feeling the strong urge to fly, not just around the pond or the island, but to go on a long flight, a journey. Those are your instincts, said the robot. All animals have instincts. They help you survive. Do you have instincts? said the gosling. I do have instincts. They help me survive also. My instincts are definitely telling me to fly south for the winter, said Brightbill. I just wish you could join us. I'm going to worry about you while I'm away. Do not worry. I will be fine, said Roz. How bad could winter be? Chapter 53, The Migration It was the night before the migration, and Brightbill was sleeping fitfully. Roz watched him toss and turn until he finally crawled up into her arms, and she rocked him to sleep, just like the old days. Early the next morning, Brightbill waddled outside and looked at the pond. The water was perfectly still. A few lazy clouds drifted above. Geese were already gathering by the beach, and then tiny claws scampered down from the treetops. So today, oh, it's Chit Chat. So today's the day, huh? Said Chit Chat, perched on a branch. You're going to see so many new things and meet so many new animals, and if there are any squirrels as your wintering grounds, please tell them that Chit Chat says hello. Today is the day, said Brightbill. The flock will be leaving soon. Are you excited or nervous or scared? I'm all of those things. The squirrel whispered, Well, don't worry about your mother. I'll look after her so you'll know she'll be perfectly fine. Brightbill smiled. I'm afraid as it is time to go, said Roz as she stepped out of the nest. Okay, Mama, said the gosling. See you in the spring, Chit Chat. Have a nice migration, Brightbill. The squirrel scampered back into the treetops. Come home with lots of exciting stories, but not too exciting because I don't want anything scary to happen to you. Goodbye. The geese were honking with excitement and hustling around as they made their final preparations. Several of the fathers huddled together, discussing their flight plans, while the mothers took a head count. There you are, Bright Bell, Loudwing honked from the middle of the crowd. We're just about to begin. May I have your attention, please, said the biggest goose. As most of you know, my name is Longneck, and I'll be leading this year's migration. I'm asking everyone to please join your families for takeoff. Once we're all airborne, each family will take its position in our V formation and will start the first leg of our journey. Are there any questions? I have a question, came a booming voice. My son will not have any family with him. Where does he fit into the formation? Everyone turned to Longneck. He can fly with me, said the big goose. I hear Brightbill is a very clever flyer. I could use his help at this point. A moment later, the geese began flapping and honking and making their way into the air. A cloud of feathers floated down around the robot and her son. You are not a gosling anymore, said Roz. I am proud of the fine young goose you have become. Brightbill fluttered up to his mother's shoulder. Thanks, Mama. The young goose wiped his eyes. Is this where we say goodbye? This is where we say goodbye for now. Spring will soon be here, and we will to be, be together again. I'm going to miss you, said Bright Bill, as he nuzzled his mother. I'm going to miss you, too, said Roz, as she nuzzled her son. The geese took a deep, the goose took a deep breath. Then he shook his tail feathers, flapped his wing, and joined his flock. At first, the geese flew in a disorganized jumble, but each goose slowly drifted into position until the flock formed a wobbly V. At the lead was Longneck, and behind his left wing was Brightbill. They circled in the sky until the V pointed south, and then geese began their long migration. Roz climbed to the top of the tree and watched as the flock slowly faded into the horizon. And that's all. Let me get my mouse to work. Bye.